So I'm going to call up the slides and see if I can go through it. Um, and Judy will be doing most of the talking. So I can introduce myself. So I can introduce myself. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have done that. Go ahead, Judy. That's okay. My name is Judith Littlejohn. I'm an instructional designer at Genesee Community College. I also teach history as an adjunct here at GCC. And so, and so, we wanted to talk about rubric and why rubric are useful and good ways to use them in black. So, I keep hearing myself. Myself. Do you hear me twice, or is that just me? Twice, or is that just me? It's fading out a little bit now, but we hear you just once. Okay. Okay. So do you want to introduce everyone else? Else? Maybe if you could put, do you have headphones around? It might, that might be why the voice is fading out. I do have headphones. I do have headphones. That sounds better. I don't know if you have them on, but it sounded better. Hold on. Hold on. So the first question while Judy's getting ready is why use rubrics? And jump in when, when you've got your headphones, Judy. And one is that it makes clear to students what your expectations are. Students often don't know what they should be doing after working in a discussion or writing a paper and so forth. And how many times do we get questions from students like, what do you want in this? Or we get something back from them that perhaps is not, uh, that is perhaps not what we expected them to do. Um, by putting together a clear rubric, we're telling students exactly what we're looking for, what we're going to be evaluating them, and what they need to do to get credit for whatever the assignment is. Whenever you're ready, Judy. <laughs> Just one second, I'm trying to get the... Okay. Um, another is that it provides a way of assessing each student fairly and objectively. If you have a class of 30 or 40 or 50 students and you've been working on grading something for three or four or five hours, after the fifth hour you might not be grading students in the same way as you were with your first few students. Um, by having a rubric with very precise criteria that you're evaluating them on, it becomes a little bit less subjective or at least it becomes much easier to maintain consistency, especially if for each of the categories you're evaluating them well-defined criteria of what you're looking for because it reminds you what you're looking for so you know it's really easy for people when they're grading to be affected by the first few that they read if those first few are really strong you might be a little harsher later on if the first few are really weak you might lower your expectations and that may be shifting as you go through the pile of, of, um, of assignments um, and this way at least it makes it a little bit easier reminding us what we told them we're going to be looking for to evaluate them in exactly those terms. Uh, and it makes it, it makes it a somewhat more objective. It makes it much um, more transparent to students and it makes it um, a bit easier for us um, to maintain consistency across all the grading. Judy? Okay, I'm, I gave up on the headphones. We'll I gave up on the headphones. We'll okay. Um, but the next bullet point, if you could go ahead. Mm -hmm. One of the things I like to do with one of the things I like to do with rubric to give consistent yeah. feedback to foster improvement. Yeah. To foster and by that I mean by that I mean using the rubric using the rubric, rubric with consistent feedback consistent helps feedback improve as the course goes on. Course For example, on. if they have um say, um say, a writing assignment for each a writing assignment for each unit. If you keep giving using the same rubric and giving feedback each time they do an assignment, do an assignment. Each consecutive assignment should have feedback that you give them. That they give them. Okay, we're getting a little bit of a feedback loop there. Um, 
but one of the things when Michelle Miller was here on um, on Friday, she talked about the importance of providing students with with structured practice. And when you have a series of assignments such as weekly discussion forums in an online class or a face to face class, or if you're giving them a series of reports that they have to do or something else where they're doing the same basic thing over and over again, it's one way of providing some low stakes testing where students get frequent feedback with um, with the chance to learn from that and and adjust to it with very precise feedback on what they need to do to improve you know it's instead of just giving them a grade of you know 60 percent or 80 percent or 95 percent you're telling them that these are the things they did well on these are the things that they're not doing as well on and it makes it easier for them to learn from that and and improve the work over time okay Judy, sorry. So as the slide says, you can also share a rubric among different sections of the same course. Different sections of the same course. So for assessment purposes, so for assessment purposes uh, it's helpful to use the same rubric. It's helpful to use the same rubric. From Blackboard, so it's from Blackboard an import rubric. So we'll show you that in the rubric. And that could be used for accreditation purposes and things if there's certain things you have to evaluate in terms of student progress or for gen ed assessment. You know, if there are certain things we want to evaluate across all the sections of a course or across all the courses in the program, um, the rubric, what Judy was just saying is you can create a rubric, export it, and then anyone who wants to use it can use it for their, their own work. Um, <laughs> This is a shot of this is a shot of, of course it's one of my history courses. One of my history courses. I'm just showing you how I have a rubric right there, right in the course menu. So the students can always access all of them. That way they it kind of guides their work, their um, goals are when they're working on each assignment. So the point is to let students know how to be evaluated before they do it, rather than surprising them when they get the work back. Exactly. And, and she exactly. puts it for each of the assignments in her class, each of the rubrics she's using. Oh, I also put them, this is a significant of syllabus. Uh, so I create- okay, We have a question. Uh, so I create, oh. A question? Sure. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, Judy, just, is, is that rubrics, is that something that we have to tell Blackboard to uh, make obvious on Blackboard, or is it there? Is, is it already there in the standard one? I've never seen it before. Yeah, if you, can you go back to that slide, John? Can you go back to that slide, Sure. Will that be there when we look at some something like this or not? You have to add it to the menu, right? Okay. Right, you have to add that with the plus yeah. sign in the upper left corner. You can click on that and add a content area. You give the content area the name of your content area, the name of your call it rubrics. And that creates the snap on your menu that they can click on. And then you would import each rubric in there. So these are all PDFs. So these are all PDFs. PDF of the rubrics you created using rubric tool in Blackboard. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Okay. Because by default, it wouldn't display them that way. Right. They don't display for the right. student. They don't display for the student. <laughs> you have to take action to show them. No, the rubric tool is under course tools. That, that um, Julia will be covering okay. a little bit later. Right. So, the so way. Two different things we're looking at here. Creating the rubric in course tools is separate from the way I was from the way for the students. Right, the rubric created in Blackboard 
is stored in Blackboard, but it, it's not easily displayed in that way. So Judy created a version of it right. that was posted. Right. You, once you have your rubric, once you have your rubric, you can go in to view it. Once you're viewing it, you can make a PDF out of it, and then put it in the course. And put it in the course. And document the students can access, much like you put your syllabus. Much like you put your syllabus. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um. So, this slide is just a snip from. My sub one of my syllabi. So I have all my so regular syllabus, and then at the end I put an appendix. The end, I put all my rubrics, and then so I kind of I, I may overkill them, but I make sure that they make every rubric before every assignment. Before every assignment. This one you can so see. This one you can see. So well well. Some of them I have to follow. Them, I have to follow others, for, for others, others for example for discussions yeah. and for projects that I do in the course. I make up my own. And in Blackboard, you can, in Blackboard, you can attach a rubric to just about any activity about any that can do. Can do. Um, so I use a very robust discussion um, rubric. Then I use departmental ones for rubrics. And then so pretty much anything that's not auto graded, you can assign a rubric. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so um, yeah, that's a good way to sum it up. Yeah, Anything that's not overheaded, yeah, auto graded, auto graded, auto graded, auto graded. And you get to that when you're creating the assignment, you can attach the rubric to it at that point that you use for grading or editing it later. Sure. Judy, if you were, how useful is it, or do you ever include with the rubric, with the assignment, an example of a perfect assignment, an example of a discussion discussion post that would be a one hundred percent or eighty five or above or something like that? There's a little bit of delay. So the question, Judy, is do you ever assign examples of of good discussion posts or blogs or other things? It depends on the type of it assignment. It depends on the type of assignment. For example, in the for example, discussions, I don't really I don't really show them that I model it and that I model it and then um and then um, if the students read the criteria in the, in some of the so she, she projects that we do, I show examples, show examples for. Um, John, do you want to tell them John, how you want to tell us? That's a good example of that. That's a good example. That. How I how I do what? Your oh, the calibrated peer, peer review. Peer right. Okay. The calibrated right. peer review is done outside of Blackboard, but what happens there is they they evaluate three samples of work against the rubric I give them, and they have to rate it on a number of criteria, uh, and then they rate each other's, and then they rate themselves. So um, they first rate three samples, then they rate three of their classmates, and then they rate their own, and their own rating only enters to the extent to which it differs from the average of the peers, which is weighted by the um, how good their initial evaluations were. That's somewhat a topic for other workshops, but but basically what happens is that students um, students who rate things very much like you do are given a high rate, a high weight. People who who just rate things sort of arbitrarily and don't pay attention to the criteria get a very low weight. So when they rate uh, when they rate each other, the students who are more serious about it 
more weight is put on their scores. And then the self-evaluation, um, they have to, to get full credit, they have to be within a threshold that you set from the weighted average of the peers, which is an interesting system because they there's no incentive for them to overstate their work. There's a incentive for them to go in and carefully evaluate it. And if you do that in an iterative process, it's similar to this, they have a chance to go back and revise and you know, reflect and improve their work based on what they've seen with all the samples. So samples can be good, but it depends on what you're trying to do. One, one concern is that if you're doing assignments, when I've given students samples of really good work, it, it often results in higher quality work, but it also tends to be somewhat limiting because they'll often try to emulate that and it tends to reduce your flexibility. So there's a trade-off. Um, you know, when you show high quality work or high quality and low quality, you know, you might get people emulating it, but they also tend to model perhaps a little bit more than you like and it might limit creativity. So there's a trade-off, you know, between the two. No, it, 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 it depends, I guess, on the level of student also, some sort of the quality of their, right. of their work. But I'm very happy with this stimulated, but I mean, at least to start with, to get that threshold, but I understand. And I think that one of the main points of rubrics, though, is it gives them the structured feedback so they know what they're doing wrong in ways that they might not otherwise see. Here's how you do it, which is your question, I think. Judy? Right, so in... Right. In your so course shell, you would go to the course tools and select rubrics. Um, you can create original so rubrics, create original and other ones, or, um, or um, rename and edit ones that you already have. It's helpful if you're thoughtful and descriptive when you name them. I think the next slide might I show a little. The next slide might show a little. Okay. No, I guess not. No, I guess not. I think it's one after this. So basically, you can either add a, create a new rubric, modify an existing one, or just select one that you've already saved in your course shell, which will get ro rolled over when you have new versions of it, or when you copy in. In all um, but one thing that uh, Judy notes here is that you should check the box to show the rubric to students because by default it doesn't display it. So only you get to see it and it loses all the effect of providing feedback unless you set it up to display. It has to either be in Blackboard or you have to create it. No, because it's actually going to be using the numeric, it's basically creating like a spreadsheet type of thing with data entry and then creating an overall score based on how much of the percent is tied to each of the criteria. So you're saying that the rubric actually grades? It actually grades. You can override it, but it, it yeah. will assign scores on each of the criteria where you could have 20% being based on, you know, the quality of writing. 30% could be based on, on the, the, the application of the content matter. You decide what's important to you and how much weight is placed on each thing, and then you assign a score in that. And there's a series of categories. I think we'll see that on the next screen. Here we go, a little bit. So here's one that Judy has used. Um, when you click show descriptions and show feedback, it will show it. This is one criteria. So this was the frequency of discussion posts and she assigned weights. So this is 15.3 out of the 40%. What happened, let me go back a step. When you create it, you assign how many points the discussion is worth, and she's using a 40 point scale. Then you determine what weight each of the criteria will be. So she didn't select 15.3, but that's some percentage, that may be, what is it, 20% or 40? I'm not sure. Uh, or some, some percentage of the 40 points so we'd have to figure that out. But uh, but basically, she assigned, to get credit here, you get full credit. Oh, she assigned 18 points for this, basically. Um, so um, so if the student, if you check the excellent box, you get the full credit on that criteria, which amounts to 7.2 of the 40 points. Um, you get 6.12 if you, you had, in this case, three or four posts. Um, but they 
they weren't distributed. They were all clustered on the day it was due or in the hour before it was due, as we often see. Uh, if a student only participated once or twice on the same day, uh, they only get five out of the possible 18 um, or the 7.2 points. Uh, and if they didn't participate at all, they get a zero. So you just click on that for each of the criteria, and there's a series of criteria that you define. So this was just the frequency of posts. Is that correct, Judy? Yep, that was that was perfect. Yep, that was that was perfect. And there's a feedback field there that you can choose to write things in if That's you want. So you could provide additional if you just want, you can just click it and you do that for each of those and click submit. Or um, you could type in some feedback to give them a little more guidance if if it may not be obvious to them or if you want to help them a little bit more. You know, I found that if you do this a lot of feedback in the first or second discussion in the course, they tend to get much better quickly. Uh, if you don't provide them with some written comments, it, they don't always adjust as rapidly. Um, a note about the feedback. Mm -hmm. A note about the feedback. If, um, um, up at the top where it says show descriptions and show feedback, if you uncheck show feedback, you don't have an individual feedback box for each criteria, but you still have a general feedback box at the end of the whole rubric. So you can choose whether to provide individual feedback for each criteria or once at the end of the rubric. And then again, you have to apply back in the grade center. Back in the grade center. Exactly. So you always have that feedback field in the grade center, but this is just rubric specific one, which if you check that box will be for each of the criteria you specify. If you don't check the show feedback, it'll be just for the rubric as a whole. You'll have a box right. for that. Oh, so we're looking at, so sorry, we're looking at the feedback box for the good. For one category. The one is checked. Um, the green one, right? The green check. No, no, it's just a general one. You type it in, you check it, and then you provide feedback. If you clicked excellent, you probably don't need to provide feedback, except to say, nice job. Okay, or something. That just seems to be very specific about clustered posts. Well, you could. So, yeah. right, you can. So, you could put it in for anything, but, but basically, that feedback will be for whatever you choose to put for that criteria. Which criteria? Well, for the, the for in this one, it's frequency. for frequency. Yeah. So this oh, okay. is one of the criteria in the, her rubric. But not the rankings of the frequency. No, been. no. It's so just a general just comment box. for this. Right. Okay, gotcha. so you put a box no, and you have to do this for each student. So this is something you'd have to type in. Or what I sometimes will do, I'll have a little document on the sidewalk, copy and paste, common types of feedback just to make it easier. You know, yes. mm -hmm. uh, because you often have mm -hmm. the same problems. And one of the most common ones is this, if you're using discussion forums. This is an example of calculates the grade, but you still have the ability to adjust the grade as you see fit. So this would be the calculated one based on what you check for each of the criteria. And it sums up to that. And you could choose just to click OK and then submit with us. Or if you decide that it's a little too harsh, or maybe it's not harsh enough, you can adjust it. Um, but if you find you're doing that a lot, you may want to revise the rubric in future semesters or later that semester. OK. So if you're teaching several courses in Blackboard and you want and you have the same type of assignment, the same writing, similar writing assignments or similar discussions or wikis or blog or whatever it is that you're doing in multiple classes, you can export it and then import it into another course. And this is what you do. Right. It is easy to share. It is easy to share. You can email your discussion rubric to anyone and put it in that course. In fact, for an earlier version of this workshop, where we were both presenting in the same room, uh, Judy sent me one that I loaded in, and it, it was really simple. It's basically a zip file that you just import into Blackboard, and it goes into your list of rubrics for the course.
but I, I need to ask again. Another useful thing I, is, another useful thing is one second, we have a question here. Data. Add alignments, which add alignments, which you use goals in Blackboard. Goals in Blackboard. You put in your course student learning outcomes. You, course student you learning align outcomes. your rubric with your specific rubric course with student, student learning outcomes. Course student learning outcomes. Then you could pull your. We don't have those enabled here. Yet. We don't have that enabled here yet. But um, they are doing that at GCC and some other schools where you can put your course learning objectives, you could put department or gen ed or accreditation based ones in Blackboard, and then you can tie individual assignments to those alignments. Um, that's not enabled in our instance, but it's something that's possible if they chose to turn it on. Um, so in the future, this is something that might be feasible because it would allow us, for example, we do this with genetic assessment for all the courses that were being assessed, then you could get direct feedback embedded in the courses on how well students did an instrument related to that category of genetic. Uh, and you can do that in the rubric. So it would look at how students are doing in the rubric in terms of meeting your criteria, and that could be part of a report on um, for assessment purposes. Is that correct, Judy? Yes. Yes. And we have so a question. In, in my yeah. example here, oh, uh, we have all a question. History classes use the same rubric the for same their rubric for their And if I and align if I, it with the learning outcome, outcome with the learning outcome, outcome, all that assessment data based, based on the rubric that we use. Based on the rubric that we use. Okay, a question here? Deborah? Yep. Uh, I, I'm still yep. not clear as to whether or not you could up you could import a rubric that you already have you'd have to recreate it basically you'd have to do it in blackboard tools um in blackboard's tools basically you, so could, you could recreate you it could in recreate blackboard it and then share it and then share it okay got it right and All so right. once you created it you can then export it to other courses and so on Okay. Um, this is a student view. Um, this is a student view. Um, you can see the um, you can see the rubric, rubric, that we rubric that we were looking at before. And the green checks and are the green checks are the ones that were selected by the instructor. The selected by the instructor. <laughs> and now when the student goes into the grade book, that's, that's, that's what he or she would see. And if we look at it, these are the categories that she used here, or at least a subset of those. There's the frequency of posts, the quality of the initial posting, the quality of the follow-up posts, and then the content contribution. Uh, so those were the, well, I guess those were probably the four criteria you used there, right? Yeah, there are more, but I think yeah, there are more. There are more, but, but, just, yeah, but those are a subset. And, <laughs> yeah, Judy has a really long rubric there, which a very good rubric, but, um, but, and then they get to see exactly what you checked on each of those, and as well as the comments here, um, and so forth. Right, that my grade box, that's exactly what the student sees when they look in the grade center. So they just click on view rubric. Click on view what was selected. And then they see separately, I think, the feedback if you have written comments there, right? Right. I think that's on the next slide. Right. I think that's on the next slide. Okay. And there yeah, we go. Yeah, so this again, the box on the left is the grade book. When the little bubble is there, when that's the bubble is there, that means there is feedback for there them. Feedback that was written, written in addition to the rubric. In addition to the rubric. In addition to the rubric. And you can see mine. So, you can see mine. So when they click on that, this would pop up. Exactly. So yeah. they, please contribute so more please was just written, typed into the grade book as if where you put the grade as if you had no grade. Write more sentences in the rubric feedback box. Both forms of feedback. Wherever you give the student feedback, you're going to see it all collected in. 
So that would be the sum of or the combination of all the things you wrote in those little boxes, if you wrote anything. Otherwise, they'd just see the score and they wouldn't see that little discussion icon. Okay, so now um, we can close this out. And any questions? Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, that should go away. I'll go back in here and stop this. And... Okay, so any questions for Judy? I don't think I understand how to actually make the rubric. Okay, maybe the easiest way to do that would be to go in and start creating one. Uh, Judy, do you want to do that or do you want to? I did probably hear, best if I do it. Probably would be better if okay. you did Probably would be better if you did Okay. So I'm going to open up a, um, I'm going to open up Blackboard here. And then I'll screen share in just a second once I'm in there. So it's, um, now I'm having trouble typing. Yeah. It's a little lag. Yeah, like on my mobile yeah. tablet. Yeah. Um, let me log in and go to a course. I'll go to a course which is inactive, so that way we won't see live student data. Um, it's a little slow because it's, it's doing the video and the projection to there as well. Um, but okay, now I'm going to go to the screen share and share the screen and do this share and send to everyone. And find that window again. Oops, wrong one. Sorry. Um, here we go. It should be under here. Um, and oh, I opened in Firefox. That's why there's. Um, here we go. Okay. So now I'm going to find one of my courses, and there's a development shell where they're trying to fix something caused by our import here. Um, the test development. Okay. So we're just going to go into this course that doesn't have any students in it. And we're going to go to a, um, let me go to a content, let me go to the one of the, oh, okay. We'll have to create a test just, well, we can create a discussion. You can just make um, a rubric without making a rubric. Okay. I, that's right. You can do it as, I, I've always done it within something. So, so we go to course tools, right? Right. Scroll down more. Right. Scroll down more. Okay, and then we go to way down to rubrics, uh, rubrics, yep. and then we, um, the option will be um, to create a rubric. You can create or import. Like, create or import. Yeah, import. Right. Um, we don't have any on this computer, so we're going to create one. And we'll create a name for it. And let's let me say this is an Echo 101 discussion um, rubric, for example. And then you could write a description of it. Um, but we're not going to do that right now. What we're going to do is just create some categories. By default, it comes with formatting, organization, and grammar. And you can delete those or change them. Uh, let's say instead of formatting, we're going to edit this and we're going to make it, um, let's say we want to do it for initial, well, let's say we want to do initial post. Okay, and we'll save that. And that's for an initial post in a discussion form. And by default, they use novice, competent, and proficient. You can add new rows to this to have other levels, uh, or you can, you know, you can um, rename them to whatever you want. But what the names you give are, is going to be common to each of the categories. So you want to do something fairly general. Um, I, what were your categories, Judy? You know, um, yeah, you know, I, I usually change the bottom one to unacceptable. Um, which usually yeah, means they do it. Um, yeah, you know, you could even use, you know, not. yeah, but you could say, um, um, yeah, you could say competent or approaching competence or let's say competent. Um, and you can create more than four categories. And you would do that by adding in um, by, let's see, how do we add a new one, Judy? 
Um, okay, that's just to reorder. Um, oh, add a column. So, yeah. so we would add a new column, which would be, um, you know, um, let's say mastery. Uh, let's say. Or so also, like I'm going to email so, you, you know, I'm going to email you import it too. Um, oh, my email's a mess though. So let's, <laughs> um, oh. let, let's, let's oh. just work with this so we can work on, um, okay. on how you would do this. Okay. So, um, so why is that not selecting? Um, I'm not sure why the box is remaining there. Um, oh, maybe I had to. Yeah, okay. Um, it's not that. No, that would stop the sharing. So um, we can hide this, though. Um, but I'm not sure. Judy, why would it be doing that? Oh, yeah, just move it over a little bit. It's going past the screen. Uh, and I'm not seeing a, a scroll bar. There, there we go. go. Okay. Um, Blackboard has lots of those. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, now, so, and then you can assign the weights. So this would be presumably 100% of however many points this category is worth. Uh, and then maybe you, you can choose whatever you want, but this might be, say, 80% of the, you know, this might be 60% uh, or 50%, and that would be zero. So you choose whatever threshold you want. And let's say the initial post is going to be worth let's say 33% of the grade, um, you know, and then so you specify this and you can add as many rows or columns as you want. You probably don't want more than four or five columns, I would guess. But, you know, and the more rows you add, the more detail you're adding, but also the more work it is, you know, so you have to choose some sort of balance and that'll be affected by how many students you have. And again, what you value in the students posting. Um, and and then you'd write whatever is in here. So you describe what it means to be unacceptable. So here we could say um, no posts, um, you know, during the discussion or whatever you want. Uh, for competent, you, you know, you could describe whatever that is. For proficient and for mastery, you know. So you basically you get to define it however you would if you were doing a rubric on paper. And then once you've done this, um, and you then you choose how much each of the categories is weight is weighted in the total uh, and then it will balance the weights if they didn't add to 100 originally these do and now we click submit and that's now a rubric defined in this course where if we created a discussion forum when you go through it um, you would have the option of going in and attaching this one of the options in the settings for a discussion is to use a rubric and it gives you the option of using an existing one or creating a new one. And then you would just choose this one and attach it to each of your discussion forums. Does that, does that help? So it's really easy. It's a little bit of time setting it up, but once you've done it, so you don't have to do it again as long as it works. So in, in my class, I would want to do it for, I have the for writing for presentation and for class discussion. And you could do exactly the same thing here. And if you're watching them in class while they're presenting, you could be clicking boxes and typing comments. And then that would show up in their grade book. And then they get the feedback as soon as they log in. In fact, they could, you know, if they finish a presentation, they can come back and see the grade there if you have it displayed. You could always hide it until later if you don't want to do it until they all get their grades. But um, it's a way of getting feedback to students really quickly because they see it as soon as you get into it. Is there any way to, I'm thinking of some, some how that this is like a wild card. It may not be on the rubric, but something like being late for a post, which you don't even want them to think about. I mean, it's supposed to be up there versus not. Is there any way they can go back and the top points or do I have to make a separate column for it? On time. You could either make a, t a, a column for being on time or you could use the override. What I would normally do is I'd put in a grade of, I normally don't allow them to submit 400, but, yeah. but if you do allow them to submit a late with a penalty, you could use a rubric and then adjust the total because it will give you the total amount of points. And if you're penalizing them by 20% or 30% or 10% for being late, you just do it at that stage and you'd add a comment with a 10% penalty for being late. You know, so you could still use the same criteria and just automate and just make the adjustment manually with the override portion. 
And that would also give you flexibility if it's because there was a death in the family or, or some legitimate reason why they were late. John? John? Yes. Can you, you, you have the Google Drive open, you, right? You have the Google Drive open, right? I do. So I exported, so um, I exported a rubric to the drive. Do you want to try to import it? Oh, okay. Okay, so we'll import a rubric just to see how, that's a good point. Uh, we will browse the computer. And we will go to Google Drive, um, which should be in this computer. Uh, and that would be in users. And that would be here. Uh, and then it would be in Google Drive, which is under my documents, I think. No. Um, it would be in, or does it show up over here? No, it doesn't. Um, that would be in. Um, they do things a little bit differently here. Um, uh, no, because it came into a Google Drive. Um, Can you take it from the drive to your desktop? Uh, yeah, that would be an easy way of doing it, wouldn't it? Um, but, but there's a challenge here. Uh, CTS user is where it may be. No, we don't because, okay. Um, okay, okay, let me open the drive and move it to my desktop. Um, that would be in here, and here's the drive, and it would be in this, let's see, there we go, um, 159, um, that would be in our work folder somewhere. Yeah, isn't there... I think it's in the second column there. In the second column there. Where is it? Near the, the top of the second column. Top of the second column. Is it? Yeah, no, that's actually the presentation that Judy was using. Um, the little dots at the top, the cube with the dots. Oh, that, with right. it, uh, um, Next to your name, but that's name. Uh, Well, let me let me see let me see if I have the. Um, okay, let me. I have to work through. We've got a few folders here. Let me find it. Um, it would be in a work folder we put together for this, and then it's going to be in the. Um, it's going to be in the rubric. Um, and then it's right here. Okay, um, so now let me move that to the desktop and move four or five windows down. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I got a lot open here. And now if I find it again, um, okay, it's um, it should be in 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 here maybe. I don't know. Um, um, it should be right in this folder, which we can then move to. Oops. I'm sorry. I should have done this before. Um, right there where it says Judith Little John uploaded an item. Yeah, uploaded an item. Rubric export. Rubric export. Yeah, OK. Um, can you just drag that out to your desktop? It, it has not yet finished downloading. Oh. Because we've got we've got a lot of video stuff going back and forth, so it's not here yet. Um, so, but in general, what you would do is you would just go to where, if you open an email, you'd save it to your desktop or in somewhere in your files. You just choose import, and it would just show up as an additional rubric in there. And then you could edit it to give it whatever name. Just as we open this, you could open it and edit an existing one. So you can either select one you've already used, or you can edit a new one. And you see, um, that's why it's got that little down arrow there, because it's still in the process of downloading. I had a question, I had a question about What down uh, arrow? What down arrow? Uh, in the dis in the icon for yes, the file. That is the icon for it. That is the icon for it. That is the icon for it. So maybe it's there. Okay. Let me go back again and try this again. I didn't realize. Okay. Um, so we are in Blackboard right here. We will now browse the computer, find the desktop, and hope that 
see it's the desktops in here are not the desktop this is oh. set up by cts and oh. um the desktop is actually hidden it's not actually the desktop uh, the desktop will be in c colon oops no we can't create we don't want to create a shortcut c colon um and then users because it creates a desktop for each person that's there and now maybe it's in here there we go okay and what was the name of the rubric which i did try to drag to the desktop but it didn't seem to drag okay one more time let me look in here <laughs> i'm sorry um Somewhere in here, there should be my files. Um, it's not my documents, not my documents. Um, somewhere there should be my Google Drive folder, and I'm not seeing that. No, because it's, it's, well, you have, but that was something from earlier today. Um, that was when I installed Google Hangouts. Um, I don't know where it is. I'm sorry. Um, Look in downloads. Just look in downloads. Well, it, it's not in downloads um, okay. because that would have to be downloaded through the browser. So, um, okay. recent places, okay. maybe? Recent places, maybe Google Drive is in there? And it oh, is not. Can I ask Judy a question? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Judy, since you've been using this for your courses, do you think there's, since I'm midway through the semester, and this is my actually my first semester here, uh, do you see any reason uh, to, uh, anything that would stop me from using rubrics from now on, even though I didn't use them? I used them really by hand. I had my own rubrics and like had grading sheets. I call them grading sheets. But the same type of thing, you know, four different categories in the first half, and then I would do them electronically on Blackboard. Do you see any reason? not to do that i mean to mix the media sort of so the question is should you start using them in the middle of the semester can basically no. can you start using in the middle of a semester using in the middle of the semester right for assignments that haven't been completed yet for the assignments for the rest of the semester assignments for the rest of the semester correct Sure. sure. You could create a rubric today. And, and, and the other half would be like, I, like I write them out. I, you know, and I told do my own totaling and that kind of thing. You're already yeah, yeah. using some, some criteria. Yeah. All this is doing is codifying yeah. it in a way that becomes right. clear for students, so that they know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, because we're always doing this implicitly. Right. We wait certain things. We're looking for certain things. There's a couple things this does. One is it. Let students know what we're looking yeah. for. The other is it clarifies to us what yeah. we're looking for. Right. So, you know, it becomes a little bit easier for both sides. Uh, and it's much more consistent. Yeah. It's no longer right. just an impressionistic view. We're looking for specific things. Um, on a somewhat different note, we we did a um, some workshops a while back on um, people grading qualitative work. And one of the things that we had someone from uh, creative writing, someone from screenwriting, we had a playwright there, we had a musician there, and we had a couple of artists there. And one thing that was kind of remarkable is they all had very well-defined criteria on what they were looking for, and they all used rubrics in evaluating work because students didn't, you know, we think they have trouble trying to figure out what we want in a paper. They have much more trouble trying to figure out how they're going to be evaluated in a piece of art. And in each of those disciplines, they had very specific criteria they were looking for, and they use rubrics regularly. So it's, in some areas, they're being used a lot. And in, in my class, because it's a discussion class, and it models what, they, what I would like to see them do as teachers, the presentation skills. Their, you know, their presentation skills are, that's an important piece, and they need to know what I'm looking for. Because otherwise, when they prepare, they're going to prepare like they always do, and they, they, will, they will get marked off for reading their PowerPoint or, you know, because of the way I, I generally do it. Uh, but if they didn't know that up front, then they would
And we observe, especially with lower level students, we observe a lot of problems that keep showing up over and over again. And this way we're giving them very specific feedback by checking a box, which can actually speed it up a bit. I had an interesting one, but I don't know that nothing. Well, this is good. Sorry about that. But um, I had a, what I call an alpha male in my class give the first speech. And I had pretty much clearly led them up to how to do the speech was in a prompt use. And he did his by closing. His closing was, well, that's all I got. And every single person afterwards closed the same way. Now, had they had the rubrics in front of them or had they memorized the rubrics, they would know that they have to do a conclusion or a closing or you know, something like that instead of just going, okay, I'm off now. <laughs> it's like, so I, I can see how it would be very helpful. And I remember my in a communication class, my I was giving, I knew what I was going to say, but I was nervous, and my I, my opening was, well, I'm really so nervous, <laughs> and I got a B, and a whole a full uh, grade was done for uh, that, and he told the whole class that was his rubric or the whole class, <laughs> <laughs> so, and no one did it, no one said it, the rest of the class, but we learned, we got that, you know, you can be nervous, but don't tell the audience, you know, because they may not know. And, you know, if you have, this is especially useful, as Judy pointed out earlier, if you're doing the same type of thing repeatedly, a weekly discussion, weekly, weekly written assignments, uh, it gives them a chance to improve, to learn from the mistakes and, um, and get better. And you do see improvement. I've noticed when I've used rubrics and discussions, they, they tend to get better on the things that I've mentioned. Now, I may notice some other problems and then, you know, you can add that to your rubric in the future that you may want to add some additional criteria, um, but they will improve on the things that you're evaluating them on. You know, basically people respond to what you measure and how they get graded on that. And making it explicit makes it easier for them to make those improvements. Other questions? I'm curious, how would, for instance, in a business assignment, of course, you do have discussions online, discussions and postings, but if you had, do you often have like an analysis of or some kind of analysis paper, or whatever, what kind of rubrics would you come up with with the or a paper, let's say, like, like, well, paper or things like uh, company analysis for a graduate okay. course I used to do. I found like if I had, I think it was 20 essentially rubrics, and if if I expanded that to 20, I got a much better paper. If I told them exactly what I wanted as far as grammar, uh, I need five years of data, uh, exam, etc. Uh, the product actually was pretty good. In fact, I remember one student who I met today is no longer who I had given them the best paper I'd ever seen. And he said, I want my paper to be the, the replacement in the model. Now, unfortunately, his spelling grammar wasn't checked, so I couldn't replace him. But um, it's easy to have rubrics um, there uh, for discussion. Did you just like repeat what you saw or did you provide a new idea? So very useful. Other One thing that just so Judy, to point out, to point out, we talked about introducing a rubric, introducing a rubric which is fine. Um, once you start to use a rubric, you can't edit it. Okay. So once a rubric has been used in an assignment, you can't change it. If you need to change, make changes, then copy it, rename it, edit, you know, then make your edits and deploy that rubric with the assignments going forward. Does that make sense? So you can't change the criteria once they've already been applied. So if you find out, so for example, in, in John's example, um, you either 
had a zero or a 50, I think. Was that, was that your lowest score? Sometimes a student takes a stab at it, but it's not good enough to be um, acceptable, but you, it's not really a zero either. So you might find out in instances like that where, you know, gee, I wish I had a column that was a 30%. I should have added one in. So you, you'd want to edit that partway through the course, but you can't edit what you've already used. So you'd create um, a new version of it and use that one going forward. So just a little work around there. Let me stop the video from jumping back and forth by muting our mic for a second because it, the microphone was picking up the screen and jumping. So, uh, and it also cut out the feedback issue. So, it did. Um, but no, that, that's it a really did. good point. Um, that by, you know, if you want to make a change, just create a new one and you could modify your old one, use that as a template, just add another column or add another row if there's something that you find that you want to add to it that you haven't been taking into account. And let the students know <laughs> that you changed the criteria. Any other comments, questions? It would be useful to have a workshop on how to, not, not mechanically how, but pedagogically how to develop rubrics. Now, I know, obviously, in my discipline, they're going to be different from all of mm -hmm. yours, but certain things that make for good rubric and for a less good rubric in terms of different types of things to evaluate, that, that's kind of what I thought that this was going to be about, because sometimes I wonder, okay, I have in my own mind this idea of what I'm looking for, but to put it out there on paper, it's, it's difficult to be so that would be, I think. What might be more helpful is provide collecting samples of them or putting in links to them because yeah. it is so different because ultimately yes. Yes. it mat what matters is what you are evaluating. And that's going to be really different in a chemistry class, in, in a marketing class, in an accounting or a finance class or a business law class than it would be in a theater class. You know, and so it's I'm not sure there's really any standard best practice because ultimately it what matters is that you're, you value certain things based on the learning objectives in your course, and it should be aligned with whatever you're trying to do in your class so that it should reflect your learning objectives and what you're trying to achieve. But that's going to be so course specific. It would be hard to come up with general. For things like discussions, you can come up with lots of examples because they're going to be pretty similar. But for other things, for papers or you know lab, or presentations, it's going to vary a bit. There's, there, there'll be some commonalities, but. What you're trying to say is, will there ultimately be <laughs> Ultimately, yes. Uh, if we want to move it up to a, a meta level. <laughs> but, um, but basically, the key is it should reflect how you're normally going to evaluate the work you know, in the, in the project. And, and that's going to vary across instructors and across that's courses. I mean, there's some general principles, most, well, said, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. and there's lots of good examples online too, that you can find, you know, um, yeah. Judy, do you have any suggestions on that in terms of good principles for designing a rubric? Well, let's start with the learning outcome. Let's start with the learning outcome. That's, you know, as John said, I think it would be different for any course, every course. Um, I think sometimes they're departmental, um, but for mine, I try to say, okay, if, if the learning outcome is, you know, to understand the causes of the Industrial Revolution and then they're writing a paper about it, then I would want to look back and say, you know, how many, um, elements of the industrial revolution are they addressing what sort of evidence are they using you know sort of break down all the sections that you would look for in any paper and uh, try to chart it out in a way that you can sort of um, distribute point values throughout it so i don't know that there's any one easy formula for everyone to use i to me i think it's i'm a big advocate of sharing the rubrics i think 
it's so much more helpful if you had my research paper rubric and then you could say, okay, I see what she's doing for history. Um, I teach business that this part doesn't make sense, but this other stuff I can use. You know, whenever you have something you can start with and modify, I think that goes a long way um, toward helping you meet your goal. So I would say in a little group like you have right there, you guys could work together and come up with rubrics that you could share. That might be um, a good way to get started. Um, a good way to get started. One thing that I was just thinking is, is pretty much what Judy just said, that maybe a good workshop would be having everyone at a computer logged into Blackboard with with planning to develop a rubric for something in the course and to work on it and then to share all those rubrics and discuss it and you know do it within the group that way. Maybe after collecting some sample rubrics, I can put some on the self web page and, and I'll work on that in the next week or so. I'll put a collection of, uh, we'll post a link to this video uh, and I'll put a collection of sample rubrics um, out there you know, as things you may want to look at. And then maybe during winter breakout or maybe earlier if people want to, we could do a workshop on creating rubrics. Winter breakout might be. And you can, you can Google it, you. You can Google it, too. Right. And well, that's where I was thinking of getting some of the same tools. If you look at Purdue's website, Purdue is a big Blackboard user. They share everything that they develop on Blackboard. So there's a lot of helpful resources right there. So that's a good idea, uh, because that would be helpful. Because quite often, you know, you learn about it here, but actually going through the steps of doing it, it's 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 not as easy. Um, and I, one of the first the first rubric I used was actually one I Judy sent me, and I I modified it. I took out a few criteria uh, just to make it a little easier, but because um, my classes were a bit bigger. But but it was really it was really nice to have um, starting point. Any other questions? Oh, we're actually out of time. So we can continue the discussion, but I'm going to stop the broadcast.